Here we're looking at symbiosis and predator-prey relationship. Here's an example of symbiosis. We've got the bee pollinating this flower and predator and prey. It's always a bigger fish. Here's a barracuda um, feeding on some sort of bait fish here. Now, if we have something called coevolution, it's a term that describes the long-term evolutionary adjustments of a species to one another. So it's two or more species that exert selective pressures on each other and evolve in response to each other. So our example here with our hummingbird and our flower. Hummingbird has a very long beak. Flower, um, the nectar, is located very deep in the flower. So this is selecting for um, this hummingbird to feed and pollinate this particular flower. So both of these are adapting to kind of meet the needs of each other. Because each species is evolving in response to each other, one important feature of coevolution is that selective environment is constantly changing. Both the coloration here and the depth of the flower is related to that coevolution that also the hummingbird is adjusting to. So how do we study coevolution? Well, coevolution is studied in several different levels. We have adaptions of the individual to investigate, um, interactions between the species, and broad evolutionary patterns. This is different than co-adaptation, which is referring to adaptations of certain species, much shorter term. This could refer to species adaptation processes processed by individuals, genotypes, and etc. I'll post a link in the um, description to this video here. It helps explain it a little bit more too with hosts and pathogens um, co-evolving together. It's constant competition that's occurring. Co-adaptation now. We have caterpillars that secrete honeydew. So honeydew is that sticky substance that ants like to drink. It's a sugary substance. The ants defend the caterpillars against parasitic wasps. After the honeydew secretion and defense are co-adaptations. So the fact that the caterpillar is producing honeydew that the ants favor or like allows the ants to protect the caterpillars from getting attacked by these parasitic wasps that literally lay eggs inside them and cause the caterpillars to be eaten from the inside out. So the honeydew that the ants like is protecting the caterpillars from the wasps. Pretty complex system. Welcome to biology. So how does co-adaptation demonstrate co-evolution? So biologists have a strict definition for co-evolution in its parallel evolution between taxa is required. So we have the example here of the hawk, the bat, and the dragonfly all having developed some form of flight. And this is looking at parallel evolution. They're all developing the fact that they can fly. Symbiosis. This is a condition in which two or more kinds of organisms live together in close associations with one another. There's three different types, which we're going to go into more detail. Mutualism, parasitism, and communalism. So we have our example, we could have our reefs here with our fish and coral living together. Mutualism, both, species, both participating species benefit. Parasitism, one species benefits while the other is harmed. Communalism, one species benefits and the other is neither harmed nor has any benefit. So look at one of these in more detail. Let's start with mutualism. Mutualism is a symbiotic relationship in which both species benefit. We have our ants and our aphids here. Aphids provide the ants with food in the form of continuous excreted honeydew. They're piercing the plant and giving the ant very easy um, honeydew access. The ants transport the aphids to protect them from predators. So the aphids can be attacked. The ants are protecting those aphids because they're the ones giving them um, the honeydew, the sugar. So this is why both are benefiting because the ants getting the honeydew and the aphids are getting protection. Ants defending aphids from lady beetles. Again, ladybugs love to eat aphids, so the ant will actually help protect that. In this case, both species are benefiting. Mutualism. Another example here um, are ants uh, providing food bodies, these kind of large kind of structures here. Um, ants are providing organic nutrients and protecting these flower regions, or these plant regions, from herbivores and shading from other plants. They're eliminating competition. And as a result, the plant's able to do better, so the plant's benefit, benefiting. And the ants, in this case, um, they're getting a benefit also. So when both species are benefiting, again, they're both doing work, but in this case, both are through the relationship benefiting from the process. They are 
um, called mutualism. Ideally in class, you would be working together. Both you and your lab partner would be sharing ideas. This would be an example of mutualism. Both of you are working towards a common goal. Both of you may be doing slightly different things, but in the end, both of you are benefiting. In contrast to that with parasitism, so a parasite. I mean, I want you to remember a parasite is different than a predator. So parasitism, symbiotic relationship in the form of predation. So the predator, parasite, is much smaller than the prey. The prey does not necessarily need to die. Prime example would be the mosquito. Mosquito um, basically attaches to your skin, pierces your skin, takes in the blood from your body, and then leaves. This is a parasite. We have example here of leeches on a fish, a parasite. A true predator here, we have the lions consuming um, their food prey. They're actually killing it completely. Yes, in this case, a predator or parasite on parasitism is much smaller. Here they're about equal size. The prey doesn't necessarily need to die. In the case of us, we may not necessarily die from mosquito bite, assume those aren't carrying any harmful diseases. Leeches do not want to kill their host, but in some cases they do, but it's not necessary for them. We have two different types of parasites. We have external parasites, such as um, we we'll call those ectoparasites, and they feed on the exterior surface of an organism. Prime example would be a tick. Okay, we have different types of ticks, but they all are ectoparasites. They're feeding on the surface of your skin. Parasitoids are insects or wasps that lay eggs on living hosts. We hear hornworm meets alien. Our hornworm, hornworm here that feeds on tomatoes um, is getting attacked here. Here's our parasitic wasp attacking an aphid. These are examples of parasites, um, and this is parasitoids and ectoparasites living purely on the surface of the organism. In contrast to that, there's something called endoparasites, and these live within the bodies of vertebrates and invertebrates marked by much more extreme specialization than external parasites. You need a parasite specifically can live inside you in your specific body system, as an example here. These are endoparasites, living within the bodies, inside, endo meaning in. Brood parasites are birds, this is an example, laying eggs in the nest of other species. So we have a cowbird and it's Eastern Phoebe. Eastern Phoebe eggs are all this nice kind of um, light, almost pinkish tannish color. And then we have the cowbird, this speckled egg. What happens here is the Phoebe species creates a nest, lays its eggs in it, and this cowbird, this brood parasite, comes in, lays one egg within the other eggs of this other bird species. This poor Phoebe then takes care of all the eggs, raising all the young, and is not inadvertently taking care of this other species, this cowbird, this parasite species that basically didn't build the nest, doesn't feed the young, comes in, lays the egg, and then leaves. It's an example of, again, a parasite. One organism is benefiting, one is clearly not. Communalism is a symbiotic relationship that benefits one species, but neither harms nor benefits the other. Clownfish and sea anemones are the prime example. Clownfish gain protection by remaining among the anemone's tentacles. They're stinging tentacles to most other species. Uh, they also uh, glean scraps from the anemone's food. But the anemone is really not getting much of a benefit in this case. The clownfish is getting a benefit, but it's not like the clownfish is feeding on the anemone. It's not reducing its ability to survive at all, but there's really no benefit for it. Other examples would be cow, um, sorry, kettle egrets in the African Cape buffalo, the species here. Uh, the egrets are the birds, and they eat insects off the buffalo. See them located here. Here's this one back here, a um, couple here on the hippo. They're eating the insects. But there's no clear distinction between communalism and mutual mutualism. Remember, communalism is a relationship that benefits one, but neither harms nor really benefits the other. It's difficult to determine, determine if the second partner benefits at all in this case. Indeed, relationships may sometimes be par parasitic. But in this case, the insects that the egret's eating really not doing any harm to the Cape Buffalo here, but really not offering a benefit by removing them. Predator-prey interactions. This predation is the consuming of one or organism by another. This is a clear distinction here. The predator-prey predation is cons 
eating the other animal here. Here we have the prey mantis eating the fly. We have um, a bird here eating a fish. Again, it's going to be it's one way. The poor fish isn't going to survive, and that poor fly is not going to survive. This is a great blue herring eating a sunfish in particular. Under simple laboratory conditions, predation often um, exterminates the prey. Uh, then it becomes extinct itself because it runs out of food. So if these great blue herring ate all of the sunfish, they themselves would become extinct because they'd eliminate their own food source. Typically, this doesn't happen in nature. What tends to happen in nature is the example here we have of our North American sh snowshoe hare, a rabbit, and we have the lynx that feeds on it. The prey is the rabbit, and you notice as the rabbit population increases, there's a slight delay within the lynx population increase, and then that will drop as the rabbit population drops, and it kind of goes through this cycle. The rabbit's population depends on the presence of what it eats. In this case, it's a willow or birch branches. The lynx is dependent on the presence of the actual rabbit. And you can see it's this transition that's occurring. High in one case, followed by peak here in the predator. Prey drops, predator drops, so on and so forth. This interaction occurs. This predator-prey interactions occurs something called keystone species. So these interactions are essential for the maintenance of species diversity in communities. The predators can be greatly reduced competition, competitive exclusion by reducing the individuals for comp of competing species. So how does this look if I said a real example? Well, keystone species here. We have feeding on kelp. So we have our um, kelp forests that exist and anemones here. These sea stars are bivalves and they're dominating the habitats here. They are, they feed on the kelp. So when there's only a couple of them, the kelp is able to grow and is able to be these protective forests and everything is well and good. However, when you take out the key species here, the one that's eating these particular sea stars, now we've got a plethora of sea stars. Well, our kelp basically goes down to almost nothing. Now, as a result, we don't have this protective kelp forest to allow fish species to occur, to protect them from other bigger fish. So this keystone species is a very important species that can vastly affect the ecosystem. Keystone, where it gets its name from, is the keystone in a archway. The stringers are the um, stones here. The keystone is that center one. Another example of a keystone species would be a beaver. They create these beaver dams that help um, can block up rivers. If you know of any people um, that live near these ways, beavers are very persistent in putting up these beaver dams that can really change an ecosystem. Therefore, these beavers would be a keystone species because they vastly impact the environment around them. Looking at this beaver, I don't know if I trust him 100%. Uh, he looks like he's up to no good. Still, he's a keystone species and can vastly affect the environment physically here by building the dam, and he may also be able to affect it intellectually because it looks like he's plotting something. 